Hey everyone, this is Mike Cash with Healing Journeys Today. And thank you so much for joining me. Um, hey, uh, just uh, just a few quick announcements. We have uh, Dave and Karen Metcalf that are our guest uh, teachers for this month. And also we have, um, let's see, I have a couple events coming up. I will be in um, Muskegon, uh, let's see, Michigan. Yes, Muskegon, Michigan at Life Everlasting Church. I'll be there this uh, Saturday and Sunday. I'll be speaking three times. So I encourage you, if you're in the area, please come visit. Uh, I'd like to meet you and uh, fellowship with you. That'd be a good time. So, um, yep. Once again, uh, Muskegon, uh, Michigan. I keep wanting to say Wisconsin. I have no idea why, but Muskegon, Michigan. And... Um, I'll be there Saturday and Sunday, uh, ministering there to, at the fellowship. It's called uh, Life Everlasting Church, uh, or also there. I think they're transitioning to Karis by the Lake, as far as their name goes. But uh, yeah, you're welcome to join us. Would love to see you there. And let's see. I think. Um, oh yeah, and then the following. Let's see. Uh, April, the weekend of April first. I will be speaking at Minneapolis, Minnesota at the Karis Bible College there. And I encourage you, if you're in the area, to come check us out. That is open to the public. Um, I'll be speaking from 10 till 3 p.m. and uh, on one awesome topic. And uh, then the following day, we will be at River Valley Christian Church. That's in a suburb of uh, Minneapolis. It's, uh, I think it's Lake Elmo, uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota or whatever. Yes, and I'll be speaking there at, at the morning service. That's at, uh, I believe, 10, 10 o'clock. So um, yeah, it's not too far from the Karis location. So you're welcome to join us at both events. Would love to see you there. And uh, that's the weekend of April 1st. And uh, so uh, Saturday, I'll be at uh, Karis Bible College, Minneapolis, and then the next day at River Valley Christian Church. So that's it. That's it with the announcements today. And let's see. <clears throat> Once again, my name is Mike Hesch. I am with Healing Journeys today. Uh, thank you so much for joining me. And uh, our topic today is uh, looking at what you cannot see. You know, that uh, really defines what faith is. I'm thinking of Hebrews uh, chapter 11, verse 1, that says, Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And that is such an important scripture to really understand uh, the difference between our natural sight and our spiritual sight. Uh, just very important to understand the difference that we have both. It's just, what are we exercising at the moment? You know, there's a scripture that I kind of uh, took this title from. If you'll go with me there to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18, uh, is a verse that really, really was helpful for me. Because, you know, uh, many people think that uh, the spirit, you know, living in the spirit or walking by faith is a very difficult thing and uh, they struggle with it. And, uh, you know, I'm speaking from experience. I know exactly uh, what that's like. And uh, the reason we struggle with it is because our default and our, our foundational view is not spiritual. It's natural. And be, because that is our default, whenever we hear or see or, or uh, uh, read, listen to spiritual things, they seem difficult. Like, how am I going to do that? And uh, that is something we're going to talk about today uh, to help us uh, get beyond that point. Now, this is a scripture that really... <laughs> That really challenged me for a long time because I'll read it. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18, it says, 
we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Now, this is the question that I walked away with. How do you look at something you cannot see? Wouldn't you have the same question? Like, how am I going to see something that I cannot see? And that's really what it's saying. It's saying we're not, we should not look at the things that we can see. And what does it mean by look? Now we could, we could, we could actually look at this scripture from a natural perspective. We could go look up all the words in a dictionary and we could say, you know, well, look means look, it means to see, and we could, you know, do all this. But let's let the word just unknot this or untangle it for us. Let's let it make, let's believe God that the word is easy to understand. Let's believe God that when his spirit quickens it to us, it requires no effort on our part whatsoever. It's the spirit that quickens. Amen. The flesh doesn't prof profit a single thing. So let's read it again. It says, while we look not at things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, I like to say, but the things which are not seen are eternal. You know, if you read on down in verse 7, it says, of chapter 5, it says, for we walk by faith, not by sight. Do you know when we when we uh, get this, when we first hear this scripture, we walk by faith and not by sight. We get a picture in our mind of our eyes closed and we're just putting out one foot in front of another with our eyes closed. Well, really, folks, that is not what faith is. Faith is actually having your eyes wide open, not closed, okay? I think of a scene in... Uh, in a movie, I think it was called Indiana Jones and the, uh, the, uh, it was about the temple, uh, what was it called? Not the Temple of Doom, it was the Holy Grail. And uh, I remember him, you know, he's reading all these things as he goes along. He gets to this place where it looks like a chasm that you cannot cross. And so what he does is he realizes that, okay, he's going to have to take a leap of faith. And what he does is he just closes his eyes and he puts his foot out and puts his weight down and he sees that there's something to support him. But that's not the Christian life. Not at all. Faith is not uh, blindly stepping places. Faith is actually having your eyes wide open. But what are they open to? They're open to the things that you cannot see when you have your physical eyes open. Okay. Folks, that is so important to understand. You know, I'm going to have to mention this because I do a, uh, I have a series called Natural Versus Spiritual uh, in, on my website. And folks, I, I, I really looked into this because uh, as a default, you know, earlier in my life, I was very analytical and everything had to make sense to me. I was one who liked to figure things out. I liked to uh, see how things were put together. And uh, that's all, I did all that through a logical progression in my mind. But when I realized that I was trying to use my natural mind to understand spiritual things, I realized that the, the precept of putting things together that fit is a godly thing. But to do it with a logical, natural mind, it is impossible. Because the, the spiritual things of God, although they all fit together, and they're more intricate than a puzzle, that, but they fit together perfectly, it requires the Spirit of God to make the connection. You can't just do it through empirical reasoning. You can't do it through uh, just using natural laws, you know. Uh, to just take, for example, uh, a natural law is uh, when you have, uh, 
you know, like Jesus walking on the water. That's impossible. Naturally, physically impossible. It defies the laws of physics in the sense that Jesus' weight was greater than the surface tension of the, of the water, so it couldn't keep him above the water from, a, from the laws of nature, okay, the natural laws. But Jesus had a law that went beyond that, and that law has principles and precepts that fit together also and worked perfectly 100% of the time. In fact, there's no law that can usurp a spiritual law, none whatsoever, okay? In fact, when this physical realm is gone, the spiritual part that God is, uh, the, the, the Bible refers to it as the kingdom of heaven, that is going to be, that's going to remain. It is eternal. It, it's it is eternal, it's unchanging, okay? So, <clears throat> it's very important to understand that uh, when it says, for we walk by faith, not by sight, this isn't something blind. Do you know that faith is something that is um, activated through knowledge, through understanding, through a promise? But it has to be a spiritual promise in order for it to work effectively in the spiritual realm. Amen? You know, we've talked about this many times before. There's a natural faith. That's things that we use on a daily basis, okay? We all have the capacity for faith. It's what we exercise it in. And again, I'm going to use the example of a brake pedal because most of us are drivers. And, uh, you know, uh, we have developed a default uh, through experience that started with knowledge when we were taught how to drive a car. We were taught right away, one of the first things we were taught was the brake pedal stops the car. If you're moving and you don't want to be moving, you put your foot immediately upon the brake pedal, okay? Now, over time, first it starts off with knowledge and we're obeying the knowledge to when we want to stop the car, we apply pressure to the brake. But as you grow in understanding, you can learn how to use the brake effectively even to control the car while it's moving, okay? So that is, that is developing your faith on knowledge that you have, okay? In other words, uh, like consider if you're uh, drive a race car, you're constantly using your brake and your accelerator uh, to complement one another, okay? Not always to stop the car. During a race, you'll never see uh, a driver use his brake to stop the car during the race, okay? But he's constantly using his brake to control the car. My example, I'm trying to point out that uh, faith isn't just uh, we can develop our faith and use it in such a way beyond just our initial knowledge, okay? The same thing is true about the things of the Word of God. Like in the beginning, when we become born again, we learn that Jesus is the Savior, that God raised Him from the dead on our behalf, that He died in our place, He bore our sins, and when we accept that that payment was made on our behalf, then we become born again. And when we become born again, now we have the Spirit of God dwelling in us, leading and guiding and directing us. But we now need to use the capacity that we have for faith in those spiritual things. At the beginning, we might just uh, believe that, you know, okay, Jesus, uh, save me. But as we learn about salvation, we realize that not only did He save you, but He provided healing, deliverance, prosperity, uh, you know, uh, confidence, strength, all of these things that we can use in our physical life while we're here on earth uh, to live the abundant life, to manifest the life that we have now in Christ to other people, to ourselves, and uh, really uh, benefit fully from the salvation that we did receive, okay? 
So let's go to, I want to use an example here about faith. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 11. I already uh, quoted it, but let's read this here. This is a good example about what we're talking about. In Hebrews uh, chapter 11, I read, I already quoted the first verse. It says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it, uh, el the elders obtained a good report. Through faith, listen carefully, through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen are not made of things which do appear. Okay, now that, that verse 3 goes along perfectly with what we've just been talking about. If you're looking at only what you can see when you're looking at creation, then uh, like take, for example, the Grand Canyon. Uh, it's a, you know, uh, a big example of this. But if you look at the Grand Canyon, you can observe as you're looking across the canyon, you can see there's many different uh, colored layers in the canyon. Okay. Now, if you're only evaluating by what you can see, then your mind is going to think that, oh, maybe that was layered like that over time, you know, or maybe, maybe, it, uh, maybe the river uh, used to be up top here, and now it's over all these years, it's just cut down and eroded all of that away, okay? So your mind could look at that, and it could say, well, see, this shows that uh, the creation is, you know, the earth is billions of years old because, you know, I'm looking at the river in my lifetime. It hasn't changed its elevation. It's still right where it is. So in our minds, if we're just looking at what we can see with our eyes, then we're going to miss the spiritual knowledge that is imparted through the word of God alone that tells us exactly how that canyon was formed. Okay. Okay that God created it. He, he didn't create the, can, the canyon as we see it, but God created the earth. And in the earth, it, you know, you could dig down like, you know, well, I've, I've dug, you know, I've dug holes over six feet deep. And when you dig down, you can even look in certain areas. I've seen different layers. Like I used to live in Arizona and they had all different kinds of layers uh, as you dig down deeper. Uh, hard layers, <laughs> you know, that you could hardly break through without a jackhammer. And, uh, but the point I'm making is that um, unless you understand what the scriptures teach about, first of all, what God created, and then you understand about what happened in the flood, you can't really understand clearly what you're seeing with your natural eyes, okay? You need more information to really see what is actually before your eyes, okay? So you can look at what you can see and not really see what it is. Do you understand? That's the point I'm making. And it says, go back to 418, 2 Corinthians 418. It says, we look not at the things which are seen. So just this verse is saying in 11.3, uh, it's saying, only by faith you can understand how the worlds were actually made and what we're looking at today. Like this was thousands of years later that this was recorded. So this was after the flood that this was re recorded. And the writer observed that, wait a minute, there's more to what I'm looking at than what I can see with my eyes. Because when I look at it through the scriptures, I see a completely different picture. It doesn't change what I see but it gives me understanding to what I see. Amen? And that is what this point is making here. We look not at things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not uh, seen are eternal. So what should we look at? Do I close my eyes and walk everywhere? No, it says we walk by faith and not by sight. In other words, we don't rely on what our physical eyes can actually see or discern, okay? We're looking at 
we might see something with our eyes, okay? But is that really what we should be focused on? Should we be focused on what we can see with our eyes or should we look at what we're seeing through what the Word of God says about it? Because that's the only way we're going to see the eternal part with our eyes, okay? Is we're going to have to look at it through the Word of God. Let's take, for example, uh, go with me to what Jesus said in John chapter 3, okay? Here's a good example. Nicodemus here in John chapter 3 comes to Jesus by night and he says, see, he's afraid of what other people are going to think if they see him. So the point, you know, that's a good point. It goes along with what we're saying. Do you know that oftentimes we are, we are concerned about things we cannot see in a negative sense? Like take, for example, you might have spent hours this morning getting ready to go somewhere, okay? Why did you do that? Did you do it because that's how you look or, or that's how you like to look? Or are you, are you concerned about what other people might see when they look at you, okay? Are you trying to uh, portray something that uh, people cannot see that they just interpret by what they are seeing on the outside. Do you understand the point I'm making? Are you trying to make an impression? Are you trying to be accepted? See, we think that way when it comes to certain things, but are we thinking that way in spiritual things or in everything? Are we saying, wait a minute, what's behind what I'm seeing? You might even use this, this would be a, we could describe it this way, are we looking at the motive behind it? Are we looking at the heart behind it? Okay. See, I'm, uh, I related that because I want us to see that we, it is something that's not foreign to us. It's something that we actually do all the time. But are we doing it in the things that really matter? In the things in our life, like healing and deliverance, are we really applying our ability to see beyond the surface? to what's actually supporting the surface, okay? Now, Nicodemus came by night for a reason. He didn't want anyone to see him visiting Jesus, okay? But yet he was compelled on the inside because he was seeing something about Jesus that he couldn't understand with his natural mind. But yet he knew it was beyond what he could understand because the first statement he made to Jesus was, hey, look, we know that you're a teacher come from God because no man can do the miracles that you're doing if he wasn't from God. See, so Nicodemus knew that there was something beyond what he could see, but he was looking at Jesus also through the scriptures, which gave him insight to what? Well, it gave him insight that Jesus was actually a teacher from God. Okay, now Jesus never wore a sign or a t-shirt that said, I'm a teacher from God. And he didn't tell people that, he, in, not in those words. He spoke him, he spoke the word of his father and he said, look, he said, my father sent me to tell you these things. He taught me these things from the word, what you call the scriptures. See, so Jesus when people looked at Jesus like a calf at a new gate, you know, and they're looking at him like, you know how your dog does, looks at you like, mm, you know, like what's going on? You know, something's happening, <laughs> you know, but they would look at him that way. And Jesus would say, look, he said, marvel not. That's what he says to Nicodemus. He says, marvel not that I say these things unto you. But let's read on for a second. When Nicodemus said that to Jesus, what did he say? Jesus answered and he said, Verily I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Or you could put it this way, he could not see this, you cannot see the spiritual kingdom. Okay? Because God is a spirit, John 4 24, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Okay? So Jesus is saying that he's saying to Nicodemus, he says, he says, look, in order to understand what the answer to your question, you're going to have to understand that you, uh, 
you have to be born of the Spirit of God to understand the things of God, to see and discern the kingdom, the spiritual kingdom of God. And then this was Nicodemus' reply. He said, how can a man enter into his mother's womb and be born when he is old? Okay, now look, listen carefully. See, Nicodemus heard the words that Jesus said, and what did he do? He interpreted them with his natural mind. The only born that he knew was out of the womb of a mother, okay? That's all that he was thinking of. But Jesus says there's a spiritual birth that where you're actually birthed into a kingdom, a spiritual kingdom. And that he didn't understand. Listen to what Jesus says in verse 5. He says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So you have to be born of the Spirit to be part of the kingdom of God. Period. Okay? And then he says this, That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. He says, Marvel not that I said unto thee, You must be born again. He says, the wind blows where it lists, and thou heareth the sound thereof, but canst not tell where it cometh and where there goeth, so is everyone that is born of the Spirit. Jesus was telling Nicodemus, he says, look, you can see just like, he said, the Spirit is just like the wind. You can't actually see Spirit with your natural eyes, but you can see the evidence of the Spirit with your natural eyes. Just like when the wind blows, you can't actually see the wind but you can see the trees bending, the leaves moving, the trash blowing across the ground. You know, you can see the evidence of the wind, but you can't see the wind. And Jesus is saying, this is how the Spirit is, okay? And listen to what he says to Nicodemus. Nicodemus, I mean, Nicodemus says to Jesus in verse 9, he says, how can these things be? And listen to what Jesus says. He says, Art thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? He said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, We speak we do, what we do know, and we testify that which we have seen, and you receive not our witness. If we have told you of earthly things, and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you of heavenly or spiritual things? Okay? Now, here's the point I want to get to. Jesus is still addressing his initial question, like, who are you? Where are you? You know, tell me about you. How can this be? Uh, are you the Messiah? He never asked that question, but that's really what he's, he's prying at. Nicodemus wants to know because he realizes this guy's different than all the other teachers from God that have come to us. This guy is more than Elijah. This guy is more than Isaiah because he sees the miracles that he's doing. Okay? Now, Jesus says to him, he goes on down a little bit, and listen to this point that Jesus makes. And Jesus says, And as Moses was lifted up, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, this is something that would have caused uh, Nicodemus' mind to really go on tilt. That's why we don't see him responding <laughs> anymore in this chapter. Do you know what Jesus was just saying? Jesus was saying that the, the Messiah is going to be crucified, that the Messiah, no different than Moses uh, putting that serpent on that pole in the wilderness. He says, so the Son of Man, the same thing's going to happen to him, and for this purpose, that you would have eternal life, if you would believe on that. Now, you know, to, uh, to a Jew, a Hebrew, um, uh, they knew that anyone you hung on a tree was cursed of God. In fact, let's go to, let's go to Numbers chapter 21. And uh, this is a good example of how to look at what you cannot see. And uh, in Numbers 21, I think we're all familiar with this account, but this is what Jesus was talking about. 
And uh, when he said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Why? That if you believe on him, you might have eternal life. And it goes on to say, let me uh, start here in verse um, 4 of 21. It says, and they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom. And the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. And the people spake against God and against Moses. Wherefore have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in this wilderness? There's no bread out here, neither is there any water, and our soul loatheth this light bread. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much of the people of Israel died. You know, uh, I want you to think of, uh, you know, fiery serpents, not in the sense that they were little flames of fire, but in the sense that they were poisonous, that the bite produced death, okay? In verse 7, it says, Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent and set it upon a pole, and it shall come to pass that every one that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass, and put it on a pole. And it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, that when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. Okay? Now, you might find this interesting. Uh, and many people look at it this way, and that's why I felt like the Lord wanted me to use this example. Do you know, Jesus is, uh, back up for a second. The Father told G uh, Moses to make this serpent and put it on a pole for this reason. It really wasn't as much for them as it was for all mankind, Okay. And it was for this purpose, so they would recognize the Messiah when he came. That's why Jesus used this example when he was talking to Nicodemus. See, he was telling Nicodemus, you know how you're going to recognize who I am? He said, I'm going to be lifted up. Just like uh, that serpent was put on a pole, I'm going to be put on a pole. And he said, and if you'll believe that sign, and you trust in that sign, he said, then you'll have eternal life, okay? And do you know that's the same picture that God was having Moses make here? Do you know that it, the Bible says that Jesus became sin for us? In other words, the very thing that separated us from God, that brought forth death in our lives. You know, in Ephesians, it says that we were dead in our trespasses and sins. The very thing that brought forth death in our life is what Jesus became for you and me, okay? See, Jesus became a, the serpent on the pole. He became as wicked as the devil. He became a curse for us. Who made him that curse? It says God made Jesus a curse for us. And he put him on that pole in the same way that Moses put this serpent on the pole. In other words, the thing that, that they were bitten by in the wilderness that brought forth death was what Moses put on that pole. And that's exactly what God did with his son. He put the sin upon Jesus and then hung Jesus on that tree. Okay, now the, that curse that was Jesus became for us brought forth death. And this is what that serpent brought forth in those people. Everyone that was bitten by that serpent, it said, died up to that point. Okay, and, and uh, this example that God made in the Old Testament was to help us to view what Jesus did for us. Now, Jesus didn't just die on that tree 
to bring, uh, to forgive us of our sins. Okay. Nor did the, did that, was that serpent put on a pole just to forgive their sin. Okay. But what did it do? Well, it not only forgave their sin, but it brought forth health into their bodies. In other words, they recovered of the physical infirmity that came through the bite of the serpent. Do you know the same thing happens to us? Sickness and disease happens to us when we're bitten by a serpent too. Okay? And, you know, I've had many, many, many lessons on this about, you know, the root of sickness being spiritual and, and our adversary being the devil, not cancer. It's the devil is our adversary. Sickness is not your adversary. It's a manifestation of the devil in your life. And that's, that's what Jesus bore. Jesus himself, as it says in Matthew 8, 17, himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. That what? That what was prophesied by Isaiah's uh, by Isaiah, the prophet, would be fulfilled. And what was prophesied by Isaiah, the prophet? That he was wounded for our transgressions, that he was bruised for our iniquities, iniquities, and that the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. See, that's what Isaiah prophesied would happen with Jesus. And, you know, uh, although Isaiah just wrote it on paper and uh, on a scroll and we read it today, Moses actually made the symbol of it in the form of the serpent. He put that serpent on the pole. Now, this is what I want you to really, this was kind of in my heart when, uh, when I read this. I mean, the Lord was ministering to me about this. And I just wanted to share it with you is that, you know, oftentimes when we look at Jesus on the tree, uh, instead of seeing uh, our sickness on him and born away, we just see the serpent. We just see the sickness. In other words, we are focused on the wrong thing when we look to Jesus. We're not we're seeing him still on the tree, bearing our sickness, instead of seeing him resurrected without our sickness. Amen? Do you know, for years uh, growing up, uh, and uh, I used to always see, and you know, you still see it today, if you're in a Catholic church, it's a good chance uh, it's still there, but they always have Jesus still on the cross. They still have him, and it's up on the altar. He's still hanging on the tree, okay? Do you know that many people, even born-again, spirit-filled Christians, still see Jesus on the tree? They don't see him resurrected. You might say, well, what's wrong with that? Shouldn't we see that Jesus became a curse for us? Yes, but we shouldn't stop there. We need to look at those things which you cannot see. That's what we need to be focused on. We need to focus on that Jesus took our sin away through the door of the cross. That he's not there anymore. That he's gone. And that when we're communing with Jesus, we're not focused on our sickness and our disease. We're focused on the freedom from it, that it's been removed, that it's no longer there. You know, many a person, you know, I hear this all the time in uh, ministry, and, you know, uh, there's a place for this, but not not the way I'm about to describe it. Most people will spend 15 or 20 minutes telling you what's wrong with them and what the doctor said about what's wrong with them, and how bleak their situation is, and all that they've tried to get rid of it, and then in a few sentences, they'll finish up in, you know, under 30 seconds, but I know that Jesus himself, uh, by his stripes, I'm healed. 
what were they really focused on? Well, they're focused on what they spent most of the time talking to you about. And then you'll hear the defense, well, how are you going to know if I didn't tell you? And it takes a little while to explain. No, I don't need to know what your problem is if I know the solution already. Isn't that true? Do I want to talk about the problem or do I want to talk about the solution? See, folks, and it's so subtle how we do it. It's because all day long, we're listening to what the enemy is telling us to look at. Look at those symptoms. Look at that sore. Can't you smell that? Oh, smells like death. Oh, can't you feel that pain? Oh, that's so bad. Oh, I couldn't sleep last night. Oh, this. Oh, that. Hey, folks, I'm not mocking. I've been there, okay? For way too long, I was there, okay? And you know, one of the first thoughts I had after I was free, I still had all the symptoms, but I was free, was, wow, I could have had this a long time ago, <laughs> you know? And I'm laughing at myself, but it's joy also. It doesn't have to go on and on and on. What makes it go on and on is we're looking at what we can see instead of looking at what we cannot see, okay? You know, it uses two words here that are very important in Numbers 21. Jehovah said to Moses, he said, when he looketh upon it, he shall live. In other words, he's saying, look, after you make this serpent on a pole and you set it up, if someone will look at that, that's been bitten, then they'll live. And then the next word it uses, it says, and when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. Now, in both cases, the looking there is not just a glance. It's not the 30-second statement after the 15-minute uh, statement about all that's wrong with you, and then, oh, but by Jesus' stripes, I'm healed. No, the looking there is a steadfast gaze. It's something that has captured your attention. It's something that has you, what would you say? I was going to say mesmerized, but not mesmerized, but captivated. In other words, it's got your attention. It's like, wow. See, now, if these people just did this, which is what we see all the time, and we ourselves are guilty of it, we'll see a promise in the Word of God, and then we'll have a challenge to that promise in the Word of God, and we'll just throw out that verse, and nothing happens, so we begin to focus back on our problem. And we'll focus on our problem for 20 minutes, and then we'll, oh yeah, then we'll throw that scripture at it, and we'll wait for 10 seconds, and if nothing happens, we start focusing back on our problem. Here's what you have to understand is you've never taken your focus off the problem. In other words, instead of looking at what you can see, we should be looking at what the Word says that you cannot see with your natural eyes. And if your gaze will become fixed and steadfast on what the Word says has been done, you won't even see that other anymore. It might be there, but it doesn't have your attention. It hasn't captivated your heart. It no longer owns you. In other words, it has no more place in you. See, that's the capacity that we have been given in Christ. And the Spirit of God is there to strengthen us and to be, when we're weak, that strength to help us to stay focused, not on the problem, but on the deliverance in the problem, okay? So these people, if they would have, when they saw that serpent on the pole, if they would have just said, wow, I wonder who made that. Look at the intricate detail in that. Look at those eyes, they look so real. Wow, it looks like it's almost alive. Oh, I'm still sick, I'm dying, I feel terrible. See, if they would have looked at it in that way, they would never have received what God set that up for them to receive.
See, God, when he set it up, didn't want them to focus on the problem. He didn't want them to focus on the serpent that bit them. He wanted to focus on the deliverance that was provided because the serpent had bitten them. See, that's what that pole was for. You know, the Bible says in Deuteronomy 21, verse 22, it tells us there that, um, how's it worded? It says, if a man commit a sin worthy of death, and thou hang him on a tree, and then it says, for whosoever you hang upon a tree is cursed of God, you should not let him remain there all night. So they knew about the curse. In fact, even before the law was even written, they knew that if you wanted to show someone was cursed of God, you just hung them on a tree. Whether it was with a rope or however you hung them up there, nailed them to the bark, what, however, you hung them on a tree, and it was to show that they were cursed of God. See, they knew that long before the law was written, and God wrote it in the law as a reminder of what they already knew, what was written in their heart. Now, so what was God saying when he told them, when he told Moses to put a serpent upon a pole? He was showing that that serpent was cursed. That's what he was showing. He, wasn't sh he was showing that their disease, that bite that they received, was cursed. Okay? Cursed by who? Well, it was if they would believe, God provided the remedy through cursing the serpent. If they would receive it. So, they may not have understood all that in the way I'm describing it, but they did know this, that God said, if I would look to that serpent on a pole for my deliverance, I would be delivered. So you can either look to Jesus uh, to magnify the problem you have, or you can look to the deliverance that Jesus worked for you by being hung on that tree. So when you look at things you cannot see, you could look at the cross. You can't see Jesus there anymore. You know why? Because he's not there anymore. But where is he? He is risen. And your solution is in him, in who he is in you. Not You don't have to get him cry out to heaven to get him to come down to deliver you. He's already in you. And in you is his life, his wholeness. Everything is in you already. And you can either look to the problem that's in you and focus on that, or you can look to the deliverance that he worked from the curse that's being manifested in you. And you can focus on that. See, that's why the Father had Moses make that serpent on a pole. Because our father was looking ahead to something his son had not even done, but he knew that's what he was going to do to his son. And he wanted to show them that there was a deliverance, not only from physical infirmity, but there was a spiritual deliverance coming where they would be one again with the father. How? By looking to what he offered for them so they could be at one with him again. That's what Jesus was crucified for. You know, Jesus said in John 17, he said, Father, I pray that as I am one with you, that you would make all these who believe on me one with us, that we all may be one in you, okay? What would you call that? I'm not sure what you'd call that, but Jesus was saying that through belief on what he was about to do, believing on him, that we would become one with the Father. Where did he get that idea? Well, his Father showed him not only in type and shadow, but throughout the Word. Jesus, that's why Jesus used that example in uh, John 3. He said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, 
even so much the Son of Man be lifted up. Now, Nicodemus might thought, well, why would that, you know, are you going to go bite some people, Jesus, so that they need to be delivered by looking at you? And no, that's not the point. Jesus was saying, look, we, we've all, you've already been bitten, and you have no eternal life. But if you believe on me when I'm lifted up, then you'll have eternal life. Then you'll be You'll be born again because you believe. You'll become alive spiritually, and you and I and the Father will be one. That's what Jesus was saying. He was saying, look, you've been bitten by a serpent, and you're dead. You're separated from God. You have no eternal life. Okay? You're going to live forever, but you're, you don't have any eternal life unless you believe on what God is lifting me up to do. And what was the Father lifting up Jesus to do? To become a curse for us. See, that's exactly what he was showing in the wilderness. Now, should we be focused on the, Jesus being cursed? No. We should be focused on what Jesus provided for us by becoming a curse. If we'll look to that, we'll receive the deliverance that God has worked for us in Christ Jesus. Folks, that is powerful. You know, let me just, let me uh, use an example here. Keeps coming to my mind. Do you remember in, in Matthew 17 where uh Peter and, and uh, the disciples, they were all walking to this house. And uh, Peter was stopped by one of the tax collectors along the way. And he, you know, he grabbed Peter and said, hey, he said, Do, does your master pay taxes? And Jesus said, and then Peter said, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, you know, the guy let him go. And then as Peter's walking on, Jesus is standing in the doorway and he stops him at the doorway. You know, I can see him just putting out his arm. And he says to Peter, he said, hey, he said, who do they collect taxes from? The children of the king or the other people? And Peter goes, well, of course, the other people. And Jesus said, look, he says, uh, then the children are free. And, and, you know, Peter goes, yeah. He says, hey, he says, you know, he said, Jesus said, we're free because we're, we're not of this kingdom. But he said, so we don't offend them. Here's what I want you to do. He said, I want you to go cast a hook into the, into the sea. And he said, the first fish that you pull up, I want you to open its mouth. And he said, and in that mouth is going to be a coin. And he said, take that coin and go pay our taxes for you and for me. Now stop a minute. Jesus is talking to a fisherman who probably never once in his life ever from his youth ever pulled a coin out of a mouth sufficient enough to pay his taxes and someone else's taxes. So what did Peter have to look at in order to do what he was about to do? See, he had to look at what Jesus said. In other words, he had to have his faith in what Jesus said was true in order for him to go forward. In other words, he'd fished his whole life. So he knew how to fish. This is the point I'm making. We know how to do certain things. We have familiarity with things, especially our body. We know what, you know, how everything works. But how would we know if, if the Lord told us like, for example, you have a symptom in your body and the Lord says, oh, that is healed by my stripes. Are we going to focus on that any longer? Or are we going to, uh, are we going to focus on that problem any longer? Or are we going to focus on what Jesus said? Do you know that Peter had to focus on what Jesus said in order for him to go down there and with confidence in faith cast that line, that hook? And then when he pulled it up, you know, when he pulled that fish up, 
He had to open its mouth. Do you know for a few moments the enemy could have got him there and, and oh, that's silly. They're not going to, what? Look in the fish's mouth. What? That is ridiculous. Can you hear the devil? Of course you can. You've heard him talk to you <laughs> about other things in the same way. Okay, we all have. Okay, so imagine this grown fisherman. Okay, what if there was other people lying in the banks fishing too, looking at him? What are you opening his mouth for? Oh, I'm just getting the hook out. You know, <laughs> no. He had. He could have said, "I'm getting my tax money." <laughs> Okay, that's what he would have had to say if he were really believed. He said, I'm fishing for my tax money. See, that's that's looking at something you cannot see. See, he had to see the coin in that fish's mouth before he opened the mouth or that coin would have never been there. Okay, do you know in this same exact way, those people had to look at that pole and that serpent. They had to look at the deliverance that God said was there for them simply looking at it. Okay? Let, let me, you know, this is the verse that our father shared with me that really made me understand uh, these, uh, this scripture. Go with me to Proverbs chapter 4. And along the way, I'm going to remind you, you know, uh, David said this in uh, Psalms 27, uh, verse 13. He said, I had fainted unless I believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Think about that for a moment. He believed to see. Do you know that's how we activate our spiritual eyes is we believe and then we see. And when we see, when we see, we have. That's what David said. And that's the point that our father is sharing right here. Listen to what he says here. He says in uh, verse 20, he says, my son, give attention to my words. He says, stretch out your ear to hear what I am saying to you. Why is our father telling us that? You know why he's telling us that? Because that's the only way we're going to see is if we hear what his word says. Do you know that his word is spirit and life? It's not dried ink on a piece of paper. And the only way to see is to hear what's being said. So if we'll hear what our father's saying to us, if we'll give attention to what he's saying, and we'll stretch out our ear to hear that, then we're going to see what he wants us to see, which is spiritual. And listen to this. And then it says the next verse, let them not depart from thine eyes. In other words, we're going to have to take our eyes, our focus off the problem in order to see what God is saying about the problem. We're going to have to look at what we cannot see. And the only way we can do that is how? By hearing what his word says. And listen to what he goes on to say. Once you see what I'm showing you from the word, keep that in your heart. Don't look at anything else. You might see a bunch of things in the field of view that you have, or you might see many things in your with your five senses, but he says, I don't want you to perceive them with your heart. I don't want you to focus on them with your heart. And here's why. He says this. He says, because when you see what I'm showing you from my word and you're keeping that, you're treasuring that, you're focused on that in your heart, it's going to be life to you when you find it. In other words, we could say it this way. When you see it, you're going to see that's your life. And do you know what that's going to produce? It says right here, and it will be health to all your flesh. Wow, folks, that is just like over the top. Good. Amen. So how do you look at something you cannot see? You get the view of what it looks like through the word of God. You let the spirit of God show you what to look at 
in the spirit, and then you keep your eyes fixed on that. And no matter else what comes into your field of view, you're still going to be seeing what Jesus has accomplished for you from the word and not what your five senses are telling you or the devil or your friends or whatever else. Amen? Wow, folks, that's a good word. That is an awesome word for us today. Father, I just pray for all of us in Jesus' name that yes, our eyes would be opened by your word, that we would choose to focus on that word, that we would choose to keep that before our eyes, that we would look at what we cannot see through our natural eyes, but we would look at what we see through your word, through your spirit, for that is life to us when we find it and health to all our flesh. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, folks, thanks so much for joining me. And I just pray that you have an awesome rest of your week. And if possible, I'd love to see you in Muskegon, Michigan this weekend. Bless y'all.